Good morning, everyone. Um, we are welcome to Turf Grass and Landscape Research Field Day. I'm just going to cover a few housekeeping um, items that you see on your screen that is rotating by. Um, Jim Baird will do the welcome and introductions in just a moment. Um, how you can participate today, please use the Q&A to type any questions for the speakers. Um, we will be reading them and helping the speakers address those. Don't add your questions to the chat because we might miss them. Chat is for comments and discussion only. And be sure if you're chatting to choose all panelists and attendees. And if you need any assistance, please just chat us. We have a staff person watching the chat. So good morning. Um, be sure to participate in the virtual exhibit hall and win some prizes. We have some, all of our exhibitors were grace, gracefully, graciously donated prizes for you to win in those. If you don't have your game, game card that was emailed to you yesterday, let us know. We'll, we'll post that, a link to that into chat. Um, each of the rooms, there will be two rooms and three exhibitors will be in each and they'll be repeating. So you can visit both during that hour. So just switch from one room to the other. We'll go over this again at 1030 to 11, go to room number two or room number one and then switch if you want to visit all the rooms and fill in your game card. The exhibitors will give you a word that you fill in on that card. So we have some great um, prizes for you to win. So we're looking forward to a fun exhibit hall. And then we want our continuing education. Um, most of you are probably aware of how this goes. The codes, let us know, here are the codes. We'll be posting those on the website as well. Um, golf course, for DPR, CERT CCA, and Professional Golfers Association. We will post um, the QR code for CCA at the end, as well as their approval code for the golf course GCSAA. So let us know if you need any help with anything in continuing education. Whoops, that one wasn't, but that was supposed to be displayed at the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we're looking forward to a great day and I'll pass this off to Jim Baird. Good morning. On behalf of the entire UCR Turfgrass team, I'd like to welcome you to this hopefully one and only uh, virtual field day. Uh, we much prefer having you uh, out on our turf uh, in Riverside, but uh, under the circumstances, obviously, this is uh, this is uh, what uh, we uh, this is the format we're left with. So we're we're happy to to be here and just to kind of introduce provide some introductions. Uh, you see several folks here. Uh, those in the green, nice green golf shirts there are you gonna be hearing from in a moment. But I'd like to recognize uh, some people that are not in this picture. Uh, number one, Professor Adam Lukachevsky, who uh, really is our head coach, I, I call him, of, the, uh, of our UCR turf grass breeding and genetics program. Adam is uh, on this uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, Dr. Peggy Mock, who's the director of the UCR Department of Agricultural Operations, which is the department that uh, uh, oversees the, the maintenance and activities uh, at the Turfgrass Research Facility. And uh, in this picture uh, on the far right, you see Steve Reese, uh, and to the far left, Joe Espaleta, and then, uh, it just to Joe's left, uh, the only person not wearing his mask, uh, that's Ingo Schweitzer. And so uh, we, we're really appreciative of these individuals for all their help uh, with our, our, our turf plots and, and their care and maintenance throughout the year. And so uh, again, uh, I, big shout out to our, our these people in green, uh, especially this year where we had to do a lot more with a lot less in terms of resources. Typically we have uh, several lab assistants to help us out during the, the season, but since most of them typically come from Europe, uh, they were unable to join us this year. So uh, our only lab assistant who joined us a little bit later in the summer, uh, but has been with us before is Luis Monticelli. And Luis is actually the person taking this picture. So uh, Luis, we appreciate all your help this year. 
Uh, I'd like to just take this, this, you saw this slide at the introduction, but I want to take this opportunity to uh, just once again recognize our sponsors for today. Uh, Bayer Environmental Science and Syngenta are gold sponsors. Uh, silver sponsors, AG Sod Farms and Aquatrols Redox and green sponsors, uh, FMC. So uh, we really appreciate your support, uh, especially uh, during these unique circumstances of this year. And then also uh, our, our uh, exhibitors that uh, hopefully everyone's gonna take part in the, the trade show uh, following our presentations. And, and those are Brand Consolidated, Gowan USA, Turf Ornamental, uh, Aerometer Company, Nutrient Solutions, Syngenta, and West Coast Turf. So please uh, uh, take part in those activities. As, as Sherry mentioned, there's some great prizes to be uh, won uh, for, for visiting uh, all of those rooms uh, at the conclusion of today's meeting. So I just, before we get started with our presentations, I just wanted to take a moment and, and just kind of reflect back on this crazy year. Uh, back in March, when this pandemic hit, uh, you know, one of the first messages we received is like, don't come to campus. And uh, by the way, whatever you had going on, just, just leave it. And so that's, that was a scary feeling, especially considering all the studies we have going on uh, at UCR. But thankfully, uh, our research is outdoors and we were able to come back and kind of keep things going. And so you're gonna hear seven presentations today, seven projects, but I, I wanted to point out and just with this slide of just all the many more things we have going on uh, here in Riverside. Uh, Obviously, our, our main areas are breeding genetics, but we're also looking at uh, other, other programs, grasses, uh, pest management, obviously a lot going on there. And then of course, you know, one of the mainstays of our program, water conservation and, and salinity management. So a lot of other things happening that, uh, you know, hopefully you'll be reading reports or, or attending other Zoom meetings in the near future where we can discuss some of these other activities uh, other than what we're presenting today. And then uh, in addition to what we're doing in Riverside, we have quite a bit going on remotely, uh, 26 different locations in Southern Northern California, also even in Oregon and Las Vegas. And these are all maybe recently finished or currently active studies and uh, um, happy to report that despite the pandemic, we were able to kind of keep everything going. Um, one little story quickly was uh, back in March, I had a airline ticket to San Francisco uh, and the Olympic club was one of my stops. And, and I remember get, receiving a message from Troy saying, Jim, do not, do not try to come to San Francisco. You will not be let in the gate. And uh, so it was uh, pretty serious then, but uh, thankfully things, loosened up a little bit and uh, we were able to, um, to, to go to these mostly golf courses and, and be able to continue our research. So we're very appreciative to all of the, uh, all of the golf courses and facilities listed here for, for uh, their collaboration with us. Okay, so I'm gonna move right into uh, the presentation on management of rapid blight and, and salinity on, on annual bluegrass putting greens. And hopefully everyone in attendance today has had the opportunity to uh, either look at the booklet or watch the video or both, because this is not gonna be a, a rehash of, of everything there. But uh, the purpose of, of the slides that we're gonna show today uh, is to show you things that you didn't get to see at the virtual field day, which was filmed on September 22nd. Um, or just any other time uh, that you, you're not normally uh, at our turf facility. So we're gonna focus on that. And then of course, if you have questions, uh, please jot them down and then uh, Sherry and Rachel will, will share those and we'll, we'll get, try to get those answered to the best of our abilities. So I just wanna take you back again in time. You know, we've, for, in terms of salinity alleviation, we've, we've kind of focused on you know, products and, and how they can help alleviate salinity stress. And I can't believe it's like eighth, our eighth consecutive year that we've been testing uh, products now. And, and uh, those two tanks you see in the picture are, uh, allow us to be able to um, 
you know, mix, mix our, our irrigation water to any salinity level that we desire. And so uh, we've been doing that for, for a number of years now. And then this picture is representative of the first four years where we tested products on, on Bermuda grass, on hybrid Bermuda grass turf, kind of simulating a fairway or athletic field situation. And uh, basically, you know, four years of studies, we had one particular program from Ocean Organics, which included DSAL, Stress RX, and XP Micro at the time. I think it's XP Extra Protection now. But this, this particular product combination was kind of a, a rose to the top in, in each of those four years of the study con, studies conducted on Bermuda grass. So uh, about that time, you know, superintendents would come to field day and, and others and, and ask the question, well, this is great, but you know, we don't really deal with that many issues on Bermuda grass, it's pretty salt tolerant, but what about our annual bluegrass putting greens where you know, we do battle salinity stress? So that kind of evolved into changing that area to a kind of a makeshift uh, putting green. We, we actually kind of built it like a T uh, with six inches of root zone mix. Uh, and then we, we were able to get uh, aeration plugs from Mesa Verde uh, Country Club in Orange County. And they have POA bent greens uh, that have, and they've battled salinity uh, over the, the past. And so we brought those in, established those, and then we did our best to kind of simulate what you do on a golf course, you know, within the best of our abilities uh, as a research maintenance facility. And so we, we tried to manage it as much as possible like a green and then introduce, of course, these, you know, the treatments and of course the saline irrigation, uh, which was at the time, I think, I believe two decisiemens per, per, per meter. So here's the first field day on the putting green. And I think many of you probably uh, on this, in this meeting uh, were also at this event. And we certainly learned a lot uh, the hard way during the first year study. And uh, a lot of what you see here is just more drought stress than, than salinity stress. Uh, you know, we were trying to keep things firm and fast, if you will. And uh, we were basically watering kind of like we did in the past on Bermuda grass, which is based on reference of evapotranspiration, but uh, typically based on the previous week. And, and so We've come a long way in that regard, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go along. But uh, things got even worse. This is a little bit later after field day. And so um, we didn't get a whole lot of information out of there other than the fact that, uh, you know, you combine salinity with, with uh, drought and you're, you're dealing with a lot of issues and uh, that maybe <laughs> products really can't help save uh, under extreme conditions like that. Uh, so what we did the next season is we kind of let that grass reestablish uh, and we had to raise the height of cut in order to do that. We were getting a lot of scalping and, and just to get the study ready for the next year, raise the height and lo and behold, what do we get? Well, as I mentioned, these were originally POA bent uh, aeration plugs. And once we raised the height, we had a lot more bent grass on the green than POA. And, um, and so we, we continued with the study and of course still learning our irrigation practices. But one of the things that we, we learned, uh, you know, in this year's, in that, this particular year of study was that particular products like this one, Nutriment and Komodo Pro, uh, which are two products from a company called Solutions for Earth, um, which are largely nutrient based. Um, products like this uh, really performed very well, um, you know, under, salinity and drought stress. And so note that this also is applied every week during that particular study. So this is kind of sort of uh, supported some of our earlier findings that nutrients are really important in a salinity management program. And then kind of fast forward a little bit more to last year, uh, what we decided to do is just rebuild this area reconstruct a putting green to uh, the way it's supposed to be done to USGA recommendations. And so thanks to PW Gillibrand who donated the, the root zone mix, we were able to establish this, this new green last year. And uh, we, we seeded 
just because we're interested in annual bluegrass because it is more sensitive to salt stress. We seeded this green with POA annua variety reptans, which is a perennial, improved perennial biotype of, of the perennial annual bluegrass. And so this is called two putt. And so this green was established last year. And of course, you can see it's under considerable stress, but we've, we're obviously learning to irrigate better um, as, as time has gone on. And so we're not losing as much grass, but there's still a considerable amount of stress going on. And what we found last year uh, under these conditions, and by the way, what we did last year, because the green was new, we just decided to start on a smaller scale. So, and focus mainly on the, the rapid blight uh, disease management uh, in that particular trial, as opposed to maybe looking at products for, for salinity uh, management in particular. So rapid blight is a, is a pathogen that is very much associated with the high elevated the salinity in the, in the soil. And um, there are, have been in the past, you know, re or there's just been very few fungicides that were um, found to be in effective against this particular pathogen. So the, the purpose of the study was to kind of look at some of the, some additional products, some that we had found, um, you know, in, in previous studies that uh, have, worked a little bit better. And so there were three particular uh, treatments that really stood out in this, uh, in that study last year. And they all contained uh, the, the fungicide APPEAR2 from Syngenta, which is a pigment with potassium phosphite. And in particular, that APPEAR2 in conjunction with Jacinil Action, another product from Syngenta, uh, that gave us the really the best results. And I have a picture here uh, to show that. And, and you might think, well, well, that's just the pigment. But if you notice that plot in the upper left uh, corner, uh, that's another product that obviously has pigment and it's just masking the, the decline, the, the lack of uh, density in that particular plot. Well, it, whereas the uh, the dacanil action in appear. I mean, that's not only a you know a darker green plot because of the pigment, but look at the density there of the turf uh, in relationship to the surrounding plots. So fast forward to this year, we decided to open this up to to be a more comprehensive study where we uh, look at um, not only products, fungicides for potential rapid blight management, but also products that will help with uh, salinity management. And so this is the picture of the, of the study. You know, obviously right after we applied the treatments, you could see that several of the, of the treatments contain uh, pigments. And so we had 26 total treatments in the study in addition to uh, the uh, untreated control or including the untreated control and um, this, this picture was taken uh, while we were still, still irrigating with potable water and uh, we wanted to get at least two or three applications down. Most of the treatments were applied every two weeks. There were some that were applied uh, weekly and there were also a few that were applied on a monthly basis. So, you know, by this time we're, we've, in eight years, we've learned a lot about how to manage these types of studies. And so one of the key things that we did this year, as opposed to before, is uh, the screen was strictly hand watered. Uh, and we, you know, using a, cal a hose that was calibrated with a known delivery of, of water. And so what we did that was really important this year, uh, and the reason why you you're going to see a lot more turf, <laughs> a living turf, uh, in, in this particular year as opposed to others because it was a quite stressful year. And, and that is the reason is because we started to irrigate based on the previous day's reference of evapotranspiration. So we're much more on top of it. I mean, a lot of things can happen when you're doing it based on the previous week. We can have June gloom one week and then be in the hundreds the week following. And um, we've had that happen many times where the turf really took a decline uh, when you're when you're irrigating based on the previous week's uh, e reference of evapotranspiration. So then, um, 
in September, this is probably the worst the green ever looked. And on this particular Saturday, we were there and the high was 117 degrees. And even standing on turf, it was just it was quite unbearable out there. And you could see the amount of stress involved. And uh, basically what we found were, and, and again, hopefully you have some reference uh, in front of you, whether it's your booklet or um, just a good memory perhaps of this is a lot of treatments, but the, the, the two top treatments really at this time and, and throughout most of the study uh, leading up to this time uh, were from Brandt. And uh, these are, you know, according to your booklet and, and the, the field day video treatments 18 and 19. And you see in front of you treatment 19, which is the several uh, Greg uh, products uh, in addition to Dacanil action. And then on the upper left in the, with the green flags uh, is the same program without Dacanil action. So these were the two top treatments uh, at this point in time and just, you know, under really severe stress uh, looking quite good. And, and, and another thing to point out is these are weekly programs. And so this, this, these were additional nutrients supplied to a green that, that we were um, fertilizing sufficiently, in my estimation. Uh, we were putting down a pound of, of nitrogen a month uh, combined, combined using uh, sprayable, weekly sprayable formulations versus a monthly granular application. So it wasn't like it was a limiting factor, but obviously adding more nutrition under, under this type of stress really helped. And you can see that in reference to the control and so then in October, uh, well, yesterday, um, you could see that uh, uh, we've, we've tried to continue to stress out this green. Uh, I'll take you back a little bit real quick. Uh, you, if you've seen the video, hopefully you have, you can see that the turf from, from September 5th to, to the taping of September 22nd made a quite a remarkable recovery, looked quite good. So we actually tried to increase the level of salinity um, you know in the in the root zone and so we actually started to over irrigate um, so we probably went from 120 percent uh, replacement of eto to 60 and then we went up to well over 200 just basically trying to flood the green and the only thing that did was make the turf look even better and uh, actually made the average uh, soil EC lower than it was before. So now we've gone back to, to really uh, very much deficit irrigation and, and hopefully you can see the, uh, the, the stress here. And this is kind of representative for the last two weeks of about only about 35% replacement of reference ET. So it's pretty stressful. And so what we did yesterday, um, Ming Ying and I, is we went out separately and we took flags and we just blindly put flags in plots that we thought were the best in, in, in at this point in time in the study. And um, so we walked from one side and then we walked on the other side just in case the sun angle was, uh, had, was playing some kind of a role in that. And uh, each plot either received one flag, two flags, for even better, you know, kind of the best or no flags. And so what I want to do real quickly is give you those performers, top performers based on yesterday. So they're categorized into how many points uh, each treatment scored uh, based on yesterday's observations. And it was a combined effort uh, between Ming Ying and I. And so number one at, according to yesterday is kind of going right back to uh, last year's treatment that you saw earlier as number nine, Dacanil action and appear two. Uh, in the next set of cata, you know, slightly below, but a tie was uh, appear two and secure action and appear two, which again was, I also showed you in the slide, which were top performers last year. Um, in the sort of the third category in the ranking, uh, two products from Harold's uh, number 21 and 24. And, and I, I see my time is getting kind of short uh, and so I'm not going to be able to, to go over all the components, but hopefully you have that, that field day booklet handy. Um, 
Number four were, was the, the GRIG program, uh, which I showed you for most of the experiment, and especially leading up to the most stressful uh, heat period. Um, treatments 18 and 19 were the, were the top performers then, and, and uh, a little bit lower here, but still ranked high. Uh, next would be treatment 15, uh, pure exclude link fortiplex and link quality. Plus, this is from Wilbur Ellis. And then um, I'm just going to give you the, the kind of the next category where these treatments followed by this set. And then lastly was uh, kind of the plots that didn't receive much in the way of, of, uh, of a flag um, of the control, which again, I think is important. I pointed this out in the video that really most everything even though it might not have been statistically significant, uh, most everything always looked better than the control in this particular study thus far. So just to kind of summarize uh, what's, you know, what's taken place and just to kind of review what's important in a salinity management program. I mean, it's amazing, you know, what good drainage can do to help you manage salts. I mean, we, we have a good, we have a good root zone mix now. We have a, it's a two year old green and it's just really hard to elevate the, the salinity to a level that we can, you know, see things like rapid blight and whatnot. So it, uh, you know, can't, uh, can't uh, say good enough things about uh, the drainage aspect, um, whether that's building a new green or just incorporating drainage into an existing green. Uh, leaching obviously is very important and, when we tried to overwater, we actually, you know, we saw that leaching effect. Um, turf grass species, obviously, there's there's species that are more uh, more tolerant than others. That's a joy. And then, of course, what we've been focusing on, I think, uh, the results that we found this year certainly uh, really support the idea that uh, nutrition is very important in the salinity management program. Um, and so, when, especially when you're talking about annual bluegrass, in my opinion, you can't fertilize it enough. Uh, however, what most superintendents battle is they, it's not like you have 100% hoe annual like we do. Uh, you often have a lot of bent grass. And so you have to be careful about, uh, you know, too much uh, fertility. Uh, and certainly we've identified uh, additional products for, for rapid blight management. Um, before it was products containing pretty much just pyroclostrobin that were effective, but um, but since then some of the products, especially from Syngenta, have helped tremendously in terms of rapid light management. You've seen some of those there. Uh, in addition to uh, you know Ballista, uh, I mentioned Secure uh, appear to uh, Dacanil action. And then, uh, and we're also identifying uh, products that deal with the salinity management and, and desal is, is one in particular that uh, I'll, I'll mention just because it's been a, a top performer throughout most of our studies. So with that, I'd just like to say thanks. I have just gone barely over uh, when I was supposed to give you more, more questions here, but uh, I think you have a question to answer uh, in this particular case. So I'll give you a moment to do that for DPR credits. And just to show you that uh, we're going to be back next year, all of us in person. And uh, that's going to be uh, our normal time, the Thursday after the week of Labor Day, which next year falls on September 16th. So mm -hmm. please, um, we have one question for you. Okay, let's answer that real quick, I think. So have you thought about splitting the trial into two parts? One part with products that contain high NPK and one part without high NPK. And that comes from Sarah Williams. We have one other one here too, a short one. That might yeah, be that's, a, that's a difficult one. I mean, we did, the, the answer is it, it's tough in a, in a, with a limited research area, but uh, it, it's, it would be nice to kind of split these apart and maybe just look at everything involved with nutrients or everything involved with fungicides, uh, which we kind of tried to do last year, or everything involved with just uh, more soil chemistry products. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly try to do that, but I think, um, I, I think, you know, it's obviously a, to me, from what I've seen, it's a, 
it's a programmatic approach in terms of managing salinity. There's there's several factors involved, and I think we're helping to identify, you know, the the the, the important components with with our research. Great, and this one might be related. Um, are we looking at total nutrients in the clippings or only sodium? Um, I believe we're going to do some nutri some leaf tissue testing at the end. Um, I, I think that was one of the things that we wanted to look at. So we'll we'll certainly try to look at what what the lab can analyze for us and and look at that aspect. But we we're definitely going to be doing a comprehensive soil testing. Uh, at the conclusion of the study as well. And, and one thing I want to point out is we're, we're not done yet and we still have three weeks left in the study and next, next week we're doubling down and we're going to eight decisiemens per meter for the final two weeks. And, uh, and so uh, we, we really feel like we still need to elevate the salinity because we have such a good root zone mix. Excellent. And then just a comment about nice presentation. So we're budding into Marta's time. <laughs> Sorry, Marta. Well, at this point in time, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Marta Pujanowska, uh, who's our, um, our breeder in, in our program. And uh, if Professor Lukachewski is our, our head coach, then Marta's the quarterback. And Christian Bowman, who is my graduate student, uh, is, uh, is tailback there. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Marta and Christian to tell, to tell everyone about the uh, the uh, UCR breeding program, as well as uh, some of the NTEP trials. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I promise you during during the video that during the Q and A session, I will show you the pictures uh, of the things that you couldn't see in the field, which technically is what is going on here in the winter, and also our remote trials. So I'll start, um, and mostly I will show you the pictures from. Um, from a breeding program. And uh, as Jim mentioned before, we have uh, studies in different locations for testing uh, ours and not only ours, but also uh, grasses from other breeders. We have studies in uh, Southern California, which is of course Riverside, but also uh, West Coaster for Coachella Valley and several studies with Northern California with Bermuda grass and Zoysia grass. And uh, this year we established one study in Nevada in Las Vegas. And well, as I told you in the video, we also joined um, a big consortium uh, within specialty uh, crop research initiative project. Uh, so we'll be testing uh, Bermuda grass, uh, Zoysia grass, Santa Augustine grass and Seashore Paspalum. Uh, developed by those universities, but we'll be also, we also sent 20 of our Bermuda grass lines and they will be included in some of the studies uh, in presented, uh, in the locations presented here. Uh, so what we have here in the winter is quite a lot of variation in, in the winter color retention. As I mentioned, this is, of course, we are going for uh, drought tolerant uh, water saving grass but with warm season grasses, we need to overcome the issue with winter color retention. And uh, I just wanted to mention uh, before I start that usually I try to show you the pictures from the time that times that were the coolest. So it, for now, like from la for last two years, uh, three years, we couldn't see more dormant grass. These these were the times that we had the coldest weather. And we can see uh, quite a bit of variation, uh, even within collection of Bermuda grass. And this winter color retention, this trait is also passed to the hybrids. And here you can see the nursery from 2018 uh, with the uh, hybrid that I told you that keeps color perfectly. And here you can see the difference uh, between uh, 180-164 hybrid and the other uh, Bermuda grass hybrids in the same nursery. Uh, this, the, that was the picture from the first winter and this is the picture from the last winter uh, when it got a little bit cool at the end of uh, December. I also mentioned that it, at times it gets really ugly and this is how ugly it actually gets when it flowers. Um, but we also have other uh, Several other uh, hybrids there. We have 
I, I told you about those hybrids in the video. Uh, and also in the newer nursery, planted 2019, uh, we had several hybrids that kept color really well. Uh, usually we get better color retention do, during the first winter, but as you can see, most of the Bermuda grasses in this nursery went dormant at the end of December uh, 2019, but we had several that uh, stayed green and 91 T691 is one of them. Um, the hybrids that were developed by Professor Lukaszewski uh, a few years ago that right now they are more like at the end of selection and evaluation process were selected more for uh, quality and overall performance but we had some uh, some success with uh, winter color retention uh, there too and here you can see the tweets from our friends so on the left uh, picture, you can see uh, hybrid 17.8. This is picture from Riverside from January 2019. And while Riverside is not such challenging place in the winter, we also got a tweet from Dr. Mateo Serena from New Mexico, where 17.8 stayed green uh, until November in 2018. It eventually went dormant, but I'm not surprised about that in New Mexico, but I was quite happy to see that. Uh, I told you that we also have remote studies and here you can see a study in Northern California in the winter. This is the trial at Napa Golf Course. We have four hour hybrids and six uh, cultivars. They're planted at two fairways. Uh, and um, while celebration went completely dormant, we had several grasses that quite co kept color quite well. Of course, as you can see around, we are not, not there yet compared to the cool season grasses around. Uh, but 17.8 was doing quite well. And here in the corner, sorry, it was too small to put the name on it, but this is Santa Ana. So as you can see, it's uh, growing in Northern California quite well. And this is how this study looks right now. Actually, the picture was taken two days ago. And um, I also mentioned that we, why we started developing, with developing hybrids mostly for golf courses and mostly for fairway use. We have, uh, we have a trial in two locations, which is uh, West Coast Turf in Coachella Valley and Santa Lucia Preserve in Northern California, where we test the hybrids that were performing better under um, uh, higher cut. So that was, this is mowed in two inches. And this is how it looked in the winter. Well, in Southern California, they usually stay greenish. Uh, this is how they look there now. And as you can see, um, I, I highlighted here two hybrids, 17.1 and 19.2, which were performing very well. But I would say that Bandera is still really hard to beat. And this is the same trial at Santa Lucia Preserve where, uh, as you can see, the, it's getting way colder. And uh, th these, were, these were the plots in February uh, this year. Uh, they all went dormant. They started greening up in March. But uh, well, it shows that we still have a long way to go there. And how I think that we'll have um, that's, it's going to be more challenging for uh, rafts or lounge types of grasses. Uh, from what I noticed already, um, grass mowed in two inches uh, mm, loses the color way faster in the winter than grass mowed in, for example, half inch. And this is the newest trial planted at Shadow Creek Golf Course in Las Vegas. This was planted in July this year. Uh, so we are looking forward to upcoming winter to see how uh, the grasses are performing there with um, way higher fluctuations in temperature than we can observe in Riverside. And here we have 20 li 21 lines of our latest greatest Bermuda grasses here from uh, nurseries planted in 2018 and 2019. And, um, and uh, also uh, four commercial cultivars, which were Tiftaf, Santa Ana, Tahoma 31 and Latitude, Latitude 36. Uh, 
just to show you as a comparison, this is our, these are our Kikuyu grass uh, hybrids, also in the winter. And as you can see, and as, as I mentioned in the video, we don't really have problem with the color there. Uh, it could be darker, but they are, most of them are green the whole winter. Uh, so we need to work on other traits. And we are in Northern California, besides Bermuda grass trials, we have uh, trials of uh, Zoysia grass lines developed by Texas A&M. And um, they were planted in July, 2019. And I would say with the Zoysia grass, the in Northern California, the big issue, the biggest problem I would say is besides the uh, disease, is the establishment rate. So this picture was taken in February. So since July till the winter start, we haven't got almost any uh, any growth there. It, it was very, very slow. But luckily uh, right now we have the plots almost or fully established. This is the same trial at Napa Golf Course, a uh, picture from August 2020. And while most of them uh, filled in nicely, you can, you can see that still there are some plots that are still growing in. Uh, so it takes really long time for zoysia grass to, 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 to grow in Northern California. And uh, you can see this also in uh, our zoysia grass NTEP trial where this is the picture from, uh, from March 2020, where you can see that many plots weren't established yet. But I wanted also to show you the variation in zoysia grass in a spring green up, while some of the plots are um, greening up very well. Uh, some of the zoysia grasses there stayed, were still dormant at the end of March. And we didn't have this problem with Bermuda grass uh, and the trial where most of the grasses greened up uh, by end of the March really nicely. And also, as you can see, plots were mostly established there. And that I would say uh, that we can see in general uh, that there is a lot of work done in breeding of warm season grasses. And also, not, not only here at UCR, but also by other breeding programs in other states. And I would say that uh, many characteristics like winter color retention, drought tolerance, have uh, re improved in recent years. So hopefully, uh, in upcoming years, you can get more uh, new, exciting, warm season grasses, uh, not only from us, but also from other breeding programs. Uh, for California, I would still recommend Bermuda grass as the most drought tolerant, fast growing and uh, disease resistant uh, species. And uh, when, I mean, if even I believe that we will be able to extend the growing period and reduce the dormancy, uh, I believe that Bermuda grass will be uh, the species that will be, the use of these species will be extended way more than it is now, which would be great for California and Southwestern US in terms of water saving. And that's all I wanted to show you for now. I would like to thank all our supporters and collaborators and our amazing team here at UCR. And uh, Christian will have a few more slides um, to show you about our dry down study of Bermuda grass. Thank you very much. Marta. There are a couple of questions, real quick questions. Doug Grove asked, what do you think the timing is on when these will be grown commercially? Great job on this, very promising. Okay, so commercially. Uh, that, this is a very good question. Actually, we are, as I mentioned in the video, we are getting ready to release a cultivar. Uh, so it should be uh, available soon, but a breeding process takes a few years. And uh, I would say for the newer hybrids that, um, that you could see in the nurseries that were um, keeping the color very well in the winter, we will be, they are still in early evaluation stage and uh, we'll plant the larger test plots in various locations uh, next year. So we'll still need a few years to see if they're actually as good as we think they are now. Uh, so I, for complete, for, green Bermuda grass in the winter, we will have to wait a few years. 
uh, it just Great. takes time to see how, how, how it goes. Excellent. We have one more question quickly. Um, Mike asks, how are you irrigating the Bermuda and Kikuya through the winter with regard to KC and ET? Oh, that, uh, yeah, that pretty much most of our plots are actually uh, mm, similarly, similarly to 70 trial at the beginning were uh, evaluated mm, based on uh, the typical historic data for, for, those, uh, for those grasses. Uh, and in the winter, it's actually according to the need. So, uh, it's reduced. If we don't water them as the same as we do in the summer, uh, and it changes depending on the rainfall and uh, and uh, and the temperatures. When they stop growing, they they don't need as much water as they use in the in the summer. So the irrigation there in the winter time, both for kikuyu grass and for Bermuda grass, is reduced. Okay, excellent. And we'll thank you, Marta. We'll turn it back to Jim to introduce our next speaker. Real quick, as I mentioned before, Christian Bowman uh, is. Uh, a new graduate student, and so uh, I'm going to hand it right over to Christian since uh, we're trying to get back on schedule. Hi, everyone. All right here. All right. So Marta got the chance to talk a lot about the winter color retention in our uh, Bermuda grass breeding program. I'll talk a little bit more about the drought, the drought tolerance in our Bermuda grass and Kikuyu grass breeding program. So it's no secret, climates are changing. Um, it's very important, especially in regions like Southern California, that we develop cultivars that are more geared towards um, saving, a, saving us um, irrigation. Not only will it help save the environment, but it'll uh, help save us some uh, economical uh, costs. Uh, so for our Bermuda grass dry down, if you haven't had the chance to watch the videos, this is a brief uh, summary of how the trials are going. Uh, currently, for both Bermuda grass and Kikuyu grass, we have two consecutive dry down cycles. This includes a 60 day dry down, followed by a 14 day recovery period, and then we repeat that cycle. The reason why we're doing two dry down cycles is because um, in preliminary studies last year, we noticed that some of our grasses just weren't dying. <laughs> they weren't going dormant when we wanted to. So we try to do prolonged studies to see whether or not the drought stress actually induces kind of a primed response in these Bermuda grasses. Um, if we can see that they're exhibiting a consistent trend in their dormancy, then that means that there's a genetic basis for that and we can potentially explore that a little more. So this is, uh, in the videos, uh, there's no way to really show this progression over the 60 day period. Currently, we're still finishing up our second dry down period. That is scheduled to end uh, actually in the next two weeks and then we do our recovery period after that. But this is just to show our top five performers and how well they actually performed during the first dry down cycle. Uh, it's pretty cool seeing how green these stayed for the most part. Uh, I have the recovery period uh, surrounded by two blue bars. And then if you actually look at the, um, oops, yeah. So if you look at the second day 30 column, you can notice that some of these are actually going, going dormant much quicker than they did in the first day 30 of the dry down cycle. So this day 30 is the second dry down cycle. Um, this suggests that there is a response, kind of almost immune response to these drought stress conditions where the plants are going dormant much quicker because they know, hey, uh, we're getting drought stress. We already know how to deal with it, uh, enter dormancy. On the other hand, um, some of these like a uh, UCR 180557 is pretty comparable in terms of the day 30s. So that's something that we want to look at further for not only from a basic science perspective of drought response, but also for um, selection purposes, for breeding purposes. Uh, it's also important to note that even though these top performers are looking great, they're looking green, 
this is intended for selection purposes in a breeding program. So some of these may do well in drought tolerance, but they were selected for different qualities. Um, some of them might have much lower flowering than the others, uh, much finer texture or um, coarser texture for homeowner lawns. It, it really does depend. And this just kind of is promising for us to be able to make selections in the future and breed more drought tolerant uh, Bermuda grass. This is just to show kind of the rankings and how well they held uh, their green coverage over that those dry down period or that first dry down period. Oh, I should also mention that we were comparing against five commercial cultivars. This was mentioned in the video in the field booklet, but um, the bottom here, the bottom five, uh, just is to reiterate which cultivars we used. And this is to show, <clears throat> it, we have a similar graph in the field aid booklet, but this is just a little cleaned up and it's meant to show the uh, consistent trend that we notice among some of the top performers and to show that there is a correlation with the plant stress or the plant health using NDVI. Uh, commercial cultivars, as you can see, did not perform close at all to the top performers and that's also very promising for us. This is our Kikuyu dry down now. Uh, Kikuyu grass definitely does need a lot more help in terms of drought tolerance, <clears throat> excuse me, but what we did notice was that Kukuyu grass has a very, very robust recovery period or very r robust recovery response. Uh, unfortunately, they go dormant much quicker in their second dry down period, as you can see here. Uh, so we, <clears throat> we actually ended the dry down period uh, 15 days earlier. So Kukuyu grass only went through a 60 day and a 45 day uh, dry down periods. And this is just to show, again, how the top performers uh, compared to currently known um, commercial checks. And that's all from me. I tried to keep it as brief as possible. But if there's any questions, uh, let me know. Any questions, Sherry? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I lost my screen for a sec. So a couple, of, we have time for real short answers, um, Christian. Which cultivar are you releasing now? So Martha mentioned this in hers. Um, I think this question is left over from her uh, uh, presentation. Okay. But for cultivars, we are planning to release, it's called a 17-8. We don't have a working name for it right now, but 17-8 um, is the one that we have put a lot of effort into and we've noticed a lot of good things about. Excellent. And then. Um, Brendan's asking, what time of year did you do the dry down? We started the dry down, uh, last year we started the dry down in July, but this year we wanted to fit more, because we wanted to fit two uh, dry down periods in, uh, we started uh, June 1st. Excellent. So yeah, June 1st. Excellent. Thank you so much. Back to Jim. Thanks, Sherry. Okay, uh, next up is Dr. Mingying Zhang. Uh, Mingying is a postdoctoral scholar here in our program, uh, been with us just a little over a year. And so Mingying, uh, take it away. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, so in the next 10, like 15 minutes or so, I'm going to go through t uh, two water conservation studies. So the first one uh, I will talk about is the USGA NTAB warm season grass water use trial. So here's the overview. In this study, we are looking at a total of 20 warm season grass, including Bermuda grass, buffalo grass, and Georgia grass. Uh, we evaluate those 20 cultivars at three different uh, reference ET uh, irrigation replacement. And you can see the cultural practices here. And here is our list of, in, of entry. You can also find it from our field day booklet. This study actually started from last year. Um, at the end of last year, I pulled the cultivar of each species together and did an analysis. So the figures here on the y-axis is turf quality, ranging from one to nine scale. 
And in the X axis, I have uh, the study months from June to October. The figure from the left to right uh, are 30% ET replacement, 45% and all the way to 60% ET replacement. Um, the bar here, the blue lines um, are Bermuda grass. Uh, red lines here uh, is buffalo grass and the green lines is zoysia grass. So now let's look at from 30%. Um, the quality dropped down over time and overall Bermuda grass has the best quality compared to uh, buffalo grass and zoysia grass. Um, at 30% or 45 and, e and even 60%, buffalo grass did not really hold a good quality, uh, which we assume is possibly because of the low mowing height we have. We maintain it at the fairway height. Buffalo grass didn't like the low mowing height. And for some of you who uh, follow my Twitter, you may find this picture familiar. Uh, after our recovery from last year, uh, in January, when most worms and grass turned dormant, uh, we have one progeny, uh, which is UCR 17-8. You just heard it a minute ago, Christian and Marta was talking about this progeny. They're working on uh, releasing this new Bermuda grass. Um, it's not only have good uh, drought resistant, it also had a uh, very good winter color is in January in Riverside uh, when most of our warm season grass were dormant, uh, it still looks quite green. This is another pictures I have on my Twitter. This is uh, in 2020, this year, nine weeks after we initiating deficit irrigation. Uh, this picture was taken um, focus on the 30% irrigation replacement. The blue dots here shows Bermuda grass, uh, yellow dots are buffalo grass, and zoysia grass shows on the red dots. So overall, we see uh, several Bermuda grass looks quite happy even after nine weeks of deficit irrigation at 30%, uh, especially the one I highlighted that's UCR 17-8, it hold very good quality uh, nine weeks at 30% ET replacement. So this is uh, three months and a half at different ET replacement in 2020. The picture cluster on the left side uh, are ET replacement at 30%. Um, as we can see, uh, after three months and a half, uh, under 30% uh, irrigation replacement, uh, most grass looks quite stressed um, because of the limited time and the limited uh, uh, space I have here. I only pick up four representative cultivar. Uh, cultivar A is UCR 70-8, which is a Bermuda grass. B is one of the industry standard tiff uh, tough Bermuda grass. Uh, C is Meyer zoysia grass and D is Cody buffalo grass. Um, as I said, at 30% after three months and a half, uh, Bermuda grass even looks a little bit stressed. At 45%, uh, this is how grass looks like. Um, Bermuda grass looks a lot better compared to 30%. And as we move to 60% to Bermuda grass, uh, looks very he healthy and green. Uh, we assume there might be some like accumulated drought effect carried from last year where Meyer zoysia grass did not look good uh, during the whole study season this year. Um, and buffalo grass again, possibly due to the low mowing height, it didn't look very good. Uh, a quick summary for this study. In both last year and this year, we see a broad variation in turf quality among those 20 uh, cultivar and entries we tested at three different ET replacement. 
Bermuda grass overall is the most drought resistant uh, species among uh, uh, Zoysia grass and the buffalo grass. Our top performing Bermuda grass entries, such as UCR 17-8, could maintain acceptable quality for about two months when subjected to 30% ET replacement. And for three months, if you irrigate at 45% uh, ET replacement. This study is sponsored by USGA and NTAB. We thank for the financial support here. Um, so now let's move on to the, the next study, product testing for water conservation on Bermuda grass. So if you join a few days in the past two years, you may recall that uh, we have been evaluating different wetting agent product uh, in 2018 and 2019. Uh, we identified uh, several wetting agent product has positive effect on water conservation uh, comparable to revolution. And our current study is actually switching gear and investigate the application rates and schedule of two wetting agent product and civitas to conserve water on larger areas such as Bermuda grass fairways. This study, we are looking at a T3-2 Bermuda grass at three different ET replacement, 55, 65, and 75%. And the cultural practice uh, are listed here. Uh, now let's look at the treatment list. So our goal are not comparing or competing different product, but instead we're looking at different rates within each product compared to the untreated control. So in this study, we're evaluating Civitas turf defense. Uh, this is a mineral oil product mixed with pigment. The label rate for Civitas is 8.5 to 17 ounce every one to three weeks for disease and insect suppression. Uh, but we don't know much about uh, how much is necessary for water conservation. That's why we're looking at um, three different uh, rate plus frequencies. Uh, this include treatment number two, Civitas at 8.5 ounce per thousand square feet apply every two weeks. Treatment three, uh, Civitas at 4.5 ounce per thousand square feet and apply every two weeks. And treatment 11 is 8.5 ounce per thousand square feet and every three weeks. We also look at Hydro Inject, which is a vetting agent product uh, from Harrow's. The label rate is one to two ounce per thousand square feet. So in our study, we're looking at Hydro Inject at two ounce per thousand square feet apply every four weeks, uh, one ounce every uh, two weeks, and one ounce per thousand square feet every four weeks. And at the end, we also look at the passage, which is another vetting agent product from numerator technologies. Uh, the label rate for passage is four to six ounce per thousand square feet per month. So in our treatment, we included uh, at four ounce per thousand square feet every four weeks, two ounce per thousand square feet every two weeks, and the two ounces every four weeks. So this is a picture I took yesterday. Uh, let's, I want to give you a general look. Uh, first, the focus on our different irrigation practices. Uh, the square, on the left side is 55% ET replacement, where we see the greatest differences uh, under this low ET replacement. And when we move on to 65 and 75% ET replacement, um, in most of the cases, uh, turf grass still looks quite good. Now let's zoom in and look at how the product uh, affects the plot at 55% ET replacement. The plot on the left side of this uh, picture is untreated control. Uh, on the right is Civitas 
at 8.5 on per thousand square feet apply every two weeks. Overall, uh, Civitas product really helps the grass to maintain its quality and enhance its color under deficit irrigation condition. Um, now let's look at how different pro uh, the same product at different rate and uh, frequencies compared to the untreated control. This is also the picture I took yesterday. The plot on the upper left is the untreated control compared to uh, three different application rate and frequency of Civitas. Overall, all Civitas treatment uh, improve turf quality and color compared to the untreated control. Now let's switch gear and look at hydro inject. It's also compared to the untreated control, which shows on the upper left of this slide. And the three different treatment of hydro inject also has very minimal effect, uh, like among the rate and different application frequencies. Similar effect uh, we seen on passage. This is also uh, at 55% ET replacement. The picture was taken uh, yesterday. So we see both uh, hydro inject and passage help to improve uh, the uniformity of the green coverage and improve its overall quality um, compared to the untreated control under deficit irrigation conditions. A quick summary for this study is T3-2 Bermuda grass could maintain an acceptable turf quality at 55% ET replacement when a given product test in this study is applied. It could be either Civitas or uh, one of the vetting agent product. Uh, we have uh, seen minor differences between the lower rate and higher rate of the two wedding agent product tests in this study. And overall, uh, Civitas, the mineral oil product uh, with pigment, it really helps to enhance turf quality and color especially. So for this study, we want to thank Intelligro, Harrods, and Numerator for uh, providing our product and some of uh, financial support. Um, one thing I want to mention here is for part of the product is also evaluated at the University of Florida by Dr. Marco Schiavon. Um, so now, uh, I will help, I might have a couple of minutes if I do for questions. Great, thank you, Mingjin. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, Mingjin, so Adam would like to answer a question from Marcos. Uh, do you really expect different results with increasing mowing height, e.g. buffalo better than Bermuda grass at 30%? Adam, are you ready to answer that question? Sorry, Sherry, that was me. Oh, that was you. <laughs> who, who is on Adam's uh, laptop. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was. I thought I could type that in, but I guess I need to. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, obviously the the low buffalo grass is not meant to be mowed at half an inch, uh, but still, I think if if it was at its uh, more ideal height of cut, I, I don't think it could comp compare to uh, Bermuda grass. Uh, we don't really see a difference in water use. Uh, so much between those two species. But uh, when we do withhold the water, buffalo grass is going to protect itself by going dormant uh, a lot sooner than Bermuda grass. Okay, thanks, Jim. And um, maybe, Jim, we have about four more questions, but we're a little behind on time. Do you, would it be okay if they type Let, the answers to these? Let's, let's do a question or two more, because I know Pavel too, I, I count on Pavel too, he's going to bring us back. Into, okay. Into, uh, into time? Okay. <laughs> I was trying. I was really trying to bring it back. <laughs> so we have a few questions for you from Carrie Reed. Um, one is your overall goal to find a warm season grass that will hold acceptable quality over the whole season at some specific ET. Is it 45 per, is 45% the goal, 50%? 
Um, well, I think it, sorry, yeah, go ahead, go ahead I'll, Jim. I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Uh, I don't think there's a particular necessarily a goal in mind. I mean, obviously the lower, uh, you know, the lower that we can go, the better. Uh, we're, we're really trying to, to develop, you know, a, a grass that can, you know, save an appreciable amount of water. Uh, you know, we typically think about that in percentages, whether it's, you know, 10, 20, 30, but, uh, you know, we're, we're confident in, in the research that we've been doing, not only with our breeding program, but with our product testing that, that uh, really, you know, using the right grass and using the right products, I mean, you could save an appreciable amount of water. And in my estimation, you know, 20 to 40 percent water savings uh, versus what's normally being used right now. And so it all depends kind of on the end user and what what your clients will put up with. But uh, we're we're kind of always working in the worst case scenario. We're we're thinking about those conditions when we have the next serious drought and and uh, turf managers are forced to cut back on water or or really stop irrigation altogether. So uh, we're, we're working as low as we can go. Uh, there's no there's no target limit necessarily. Great, and we have a few short questions, hopefully. Um, Mike has asked, how often were the applications made in the ET study, daily, weekly, other? Mingying, do you wanna? Yeah, so we water uh, the plot three times per week according to the previx of ET. So it's basically, uh, uh, we water the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Okay. And Roberto Gergel has asked, what is the cost per area of the Civitas project? Uh, that's not something that we, we can answer. We don't deal with the economics of products. We just deal more with the testing. Okay, great. So um, there's a couple more questions, but I think maybe Mingying, if you could answer those by typing them, is that okay from Gary? Yeah. And then we'll go to break. We'll be back in five minutes. So let's try to get back at 9.50 and then we'll rely on Pavel to keep get us back on time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It's take a five minute stretch break. Okay, welcome back everybody. It's 9.50. Um, Pal, would you like to start sharing your screen and Jim will introduce you here. And if we do get time, if we save some time, we'll come back to the questions that did not get answered. Um, we just had the exhibit hall, so it's important to try and stay on time with that. So we'll do our best to come back to these that didn't get answered. Okay, so next up is soon to be almost Dr. Pavel Orlinski, and Pavel's going to share some of his uh, weed research uh, trials with us. Could take it away, Pavel. Hello, everybody. And the studies that I'm about to present focus on pre emergent herbicides for crabgrass control and post emergent control for broadleaf weeds. And I assume you've already watched videos and read the report. So my main purpose of this presentation is to show you how it looked in time. Uh, so first, I'll talk about pre-emergent herbicides for control of smooth crabgrass. And as I mentioned on the video, we focus here on granular herbicides only. Mm, this photo was taken on July, in July, so three months after initial application of herbicides and uh, six weeks after second application. And before temperatures went up and started smoking some of our crabgrass. Uh, so for now, let's focus on the herbicides. And so before we go to crabgrass, which was the main target here, I just wanted to show you how some of those products worked on annual bluegrass that was present there uh, during the initiation of the study. And here we have three plots in the middle of the picture. And from the bottom is freehand, uh, then spectacle G and crew. And you can see that freehand and spectacle G plots clearly stand out and uh, the POA there, like there is no POA there anymore. Uh, there is of course slender celery, which was there until approximately July as well. And that they had, 
that leads me to the downside of this post-emergent activity about the uh, activity about the annual bluegrass because slender celery that was there that took over place after poa and crabgrass and just took over the whole plot. So uh, let's see what happens when we don't apply anything and we expect to have quite high pressure from crabgrass. So the following four slides will have the same layout. And the big picture here uh, is the picture of the plot taken on September 1st and under it are light box photos taken each month. And Crew was the herbicide that won this competition and especially successful treatment was when it was applied twice at 150 pounds per acre uh, in the interval of six weeks. Uh, on the lightbox photos, you can see that some crabgrass was showing at the end of July and those single plants, plants grew uh, larger over time and eventually provided 12 cover by the end of the 12% cover by the end of the study. For spectacle G applied at the same schedule, uh, you can see the young crabgrass plant showing up at the end of June. And on the same photo, you can also see how high was the pressure from slender celery. And uh, I'm talking here about the plot, the, the picture here uh, from Lightbox. Uh, this, all of this dark, green color here is uh, basically uh, slender celery. And uh, this weed was already present on the whole study area before treatment initiation. So I personally think that uh, those were already established there and grew larger with no competition from neither poa nor crabgrass. And freehand acted very similarly to Spectacle G, although there were some differences between them. Uh, its activity on annual bluegrass was faster. And just after one week, those plots were already visible with annual bluegrass turning brown. Um, additionally, it kept crabgrass in check longer as were, there were no visible crabgrass plants on those plots in June. Uh, there is maybe, this is maybe not the best photo for this, but the pressure from the slender celery, celery was also very high. And uh, the last herbicide tested here is Stronstar G, and you can see the crabgrass plants visible already in May and uh, in quite high density. And slender celery was also present, but not as much as on plot treated with crew, spectacle G or freehand but still more than in untreated control. And this is probably also a good place to say that results might have been totally different if applications were done truly before emergence of the crabgrass. Because as I mentioned on the video, crabgrass already started emerging when we started, the, when we initiated the trial. Um, I also want to quickly show you the rates for those products starting with crew, the maximum in a year is 600 pounds per acre for turf grass. So we only applied half of that. Uh, but at the same time, this was highest possible rate for ornamentals. And all the other products can be applied at most at 400 pounds per acre, but both in turf grass and ornamental. Uh, there is one difference for Ronstar G that generally can be applied in 300 pounds per acre in the highest yearly rate. But in case of high infestation, and I think we can agree that this is the case here, we can go up to 400 pounds per acre. And now I'll quickly go over the second study that was about broadleaf weed. Uh, despite the fact that crabgrass was the major weed present there, and that's because I was very stubborn not to apply any pre-emergent herbicide there. So as usual, untreated control first. At the time of initiation of the study on July 8, we had quite some slender cellar recover and some spots with higher density of yellow wood sorrel. So the pictures you see here were taken from the same spot using Clyde. 
a monument work on yellow work on yellow wood sorrel and its population dropped dramatically with only one application and second application provided almost total control. Uh, it also suppressed crabgrass plants and helped eradicate slender celery faster. But as you can see, spotted spurge was present on the plants throughout the study. Um, it's a similar story for Tribute Total, and like I mentioned in the video, uh, in addition to control of yellow wood sorrel, slender celery, and suppression of crabgrass, it also provided good control of spotted spurge. Uh, Celsius, also similar story, although less activity on crabgrass. Uh, by the end of the study, there were no visible yellow wood sorrel plants on the treated plots. And um, I can't really recommend Spitzel Southern for yellow wood sorrel control as this was uh, one of the worst treatments here, but this herbicide provided very good control of spotted spurge and slender celery. But for yellow wood sorrel, it's, the control lasted only two weeks following each application. Um, Game on herbicide had the best activity on yellow wood sorrel for all tested products and very good activity against slender celery and spurge. Uh, actually with higher rates, so at four points per acre, initial evaluation was the only one when we saw spotted spurge um, on the treated plots. And plots were also cleaned for, from yellow wood sorrel in two weeks. Oh, and uh, this product was applied only once, so there was no need for reapplication. And the uh, last product I wanted to present to you is SP37938, uh, the new herbicide that will be introduced by Bayer. And this treatment was on pair with Game On regarding control of broadleaf weeds, but two applications were needed in total. And uh, one thing I wanted to clarify is that this photo is a little bit misleading. Also, this, although this product had some activity on crabgrass, it wasn't that high as it appears here. Um, however, we are testing it also for control of yellow and purple nastage, and so far it showed pretty good activity on this. And this concludes this presentation, so I would like to thank all of you for participating, and if you have any questions, please ask them. So, Pell, we have no questions yet for you, but I wanted to get back since we have a few minutes. I know that Min Ying um, actually answered it um, by typing it, but there was a question from Kerry Reed about why do you not include the maximum recharge, I think it's recharge, REC rate for Savitas and passage in your treatments? And Ming Ying, you could just answer that, if you could just answer that for Carrie live. Um, yes, our, I think first for Civitas, there, there is no recommended rate uh, for use uh, uh, for water conservation. So the current label rate is for uh, insect and uh, disease management. Um, I think we're using 8.5 ounce was based on the industry recommended, like the company recommended rate. Plus uh, for both Civitas and Passage, our goal is to evaluate the minimal rate to save money to save product for the larger scale. That's why we didn't, we did not go to 17 ounce. And plus our preliminary study from last year, uh, 8.5 ounce per thousand um, already have very good results. So that was not like a necessary for us for the second year to go even higher. Uh, we got really pre present, uh, like very good results from the last year using 8.5 ounce Thank for you. CVS. Sorry, thank you, Ming Ying. We yeah. do have a couple more for Pal now. Um, Pal, did you see any phytoturf safety differences in your post broadleaf study? And what were the air temps at application? So I don't have my like notes right now about the 
temperatures of, of application, but what we try to do is spray as close to sunrise as possible. So I would say around 65 to 75 uh, Fahrenheit degrees, that was the temperature. And um, they wanted uh, to study phyto turf safety differences in your yes. post so basically with the crabgrass cover that we had there it was hard to tell when bermuda grass when he were was injured or the whole plot was just uh just injured because the only plots that stayed green following application was game on and speed so southern uh, most of the other products show some of the phytotoxicity but when you have almost 100 percent of Crabgrass cover. It's really hard to tell um, if the the phytotoxicity was on Bermuda grass. I know that some of those products will cause uh, phytotoxicity. Great. And we have one more short question. Hopefully, a time for a short answer <laughs> from Frank McDonoghue. Does Civetis have a temp temp application limit? I think that's the question to Mingying. Oh, Mingying. Sorry. Ming Ying. We'll come back to that if we have time after Pat, the next presentation. I'll turn it back to Jim. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Pavel. So now we're going to move on to last but not least, uh, actually known as Pavel One, is Dr. Pavel Patelovich. And Pavel's going to enlighten us about this year's anthracnose fungicide trial. Take it away, Pavel. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Jim. Um, let me just quickly share with you my screen and uh, I hope it's gonna work. Can you see everything I see? Um, I hope so. Terrific. Yes. Okay, yeah. So my name is Pavel Patelovich. Um, with Pavel Orlinski, we try to keep it simple for you guys. So you just share one name so you could just refer to both of us. We are both in best management here at UCR. So whichever Pavel you're going to ask questions, we're going to try to answer them to the best of our knowledge. I apologize in the beginning. It's the first time I try to kind of like mingle between two screens here um, just to just to be able to provide you with the best uh, presentation possible. So um, again, good morning. Uh, this presentation is going to be just a quick short five minute hopefully update on what basically happened from the time of video recordings, which was September 22nd, to through actually the time when uh, we put together the report and uh, up until today. So actually uh, the final rating event was October 7th. Um, so I will do my best to just update you on that. I'm not going to go into the details on any materials and methods. I hope you all uh, saw the video and you all saw the report, which by the way is on pages 60 through 67 in our uh, booklet. Um, and based on that information, I'm just going to highlight some changes that occurred uh, through that time. I'm trying to change slide here. Oh, okay, now it works, right? So what you see here is the comparison of overall disease cover um, in untreated control, which is a solid red line versus uh, the average uh, pulled over all of the treatments, which is the dashed red line. And you can also see here the uh, average disease cover marked in blue, solid line for untreated control and the uh, dashed line for, uh, for the average uh, across the treatments. So basically, as I have already mentioned in both the video and the report, the disease started being noticeable in the middle of July. Uh, and starting from there, the disease symptoms uh, were quite steadily developing, as you can see here. Uh, we observed the peak of the disease uh, cover on August 25th. 25th, but uh, you can see that from this date, uh, the disease cover started dropping, and especially in untreated, actually in untreated control, which might be due to uh, some differences in repetitions. Um, however, the uh, anthracnose at this point did not slow down, 
and we could have seen uh, the increase, increased severity of the symptoms, symptoms within that uh, cover. Um, also, uh, so, and, and that ultimately translated into the increased uh, turf grass uh, loss uh, within those plots. Also, the uh, disease cover within uh, treated plots was also still increasing. So on September 9th, we've got uh, a little bit lower uh, disease cover, but the highest severity of, uh, of the disease pressure. Uh, this is our reference point that I used in both the video and the, um, and the report. And starting from this day, you can see that uh, plots started recovering also uh, quite steadily. Um, and by the, uh, October, by the final rating event, October 7th, uh, we had uh, maximum uh, disease uh, cover around 20% uh, and maximum uh, loss of uh, turf grass cover around 15%. Uh, um, here, I just wanted to show you uh, how it looked like in real life. So we've got here the comparison of an actually one untreated uh, control plot. On the left-hand side, you can see the photo taken on August 25th. Um, you can see that uh, the, disease, uh, the disease caused damage is pretty severe, but two weeks later, um, two weeks after final uh, treatment, uh, the disease uh, was at its actually peak. And October 7th, the untreated control plot was actually uh, almost fully recovered and there's a quite a lot of uh, new growth. What I wanted to show you also is the plots that you were not able to see uh, in our video. Our video was taken, uh, our video was shot uh, on September 22nd, like I said, two weeks after um, the peak of the disease and already some um, regeneration was observed within those plots. But here you can see uh, how well some of the treatments were, uh, were doing. Uh, top performers, I'm going to only show you top performers that I mentioned in both report and the video, uh, starting from briskway at 1.2 ounces per thousand square feet. And you can see on the left hand side, pro practically a uh, whole plot, whole untreated plot yet yeah, is uh, chewed up by the anthracnose and uh, briskway uh, provides quite well uh, quite good control. Then BASF program number one, which provided, uh, maintained uh, the disease cover uh, below 5%, and that was our leader in that comparison by September 9th. Oh, sorry, BASF program number one. I, I confused BASF program number one with the BEAR program number one. Sorry for that. So this is BASF program number one. Then we have uh, one of the experimental treatments, uh, UCR005. Um, we had uh, two of those in our study. So uh, basically we're referring to treatment 29 in here. Then we've got bear program number two, and you can also see that curve here is uh, darker and, and, and looks uh, nicer. And then I uh, already mentioned bear program number one, which provided the best uh, control up to September 9th. Uh, disease uh, cover below 5% and the highest uh, possible quality. And that was throughout uh, the time when the treatments were applied. On this slide, we can see the comparison of uh, the disease cover on September 9th, so at the peak of the disease, and on October 7th, so six weeks after the final treatment. And apart from the untreated, the regeneration and untreated control and decrease in uh, disease cover, uh, what I wanted to highlight here is that some of the treatments um, provided longer lasting control than the others. And actually, Bayer program uh, number one, which was uh, providing our, uh, which was maintaining the disease cover below 5% at September 9th, on October 7th, uh, broke and basically the disease cover in this treatment was uh, crossed the threshold of 10% and actually reached almost 20% while Bayer program number two uh, further decreased the disease cover. 
I wanted to show you those two plots also, the comparison of their program number one at September 9th on the left and October 7th on the right versus Bayer program number two, September 9th uh, on the left-hand side again and October 7th on the right. The, there's probably a few factors, uh, a couple of factors that might have impacted this uh, situation, but one of those uh, is basically uh, the addition of triadimethan uh, to the final application of uh, Bayer program number uh, two which might have also uh, extended the uh, control of the disease. So just to, just to conclude the study real quick, um, all the treatments except of Primomax, Autilus with RSG and UCR03 uh, significantly decreased anthracnose cover uh, when compared to the control and average disease pressure across the study when the average disease uh, across the study was as, as, as highest than the disease cover. Uh, was equal or below 10% at the time of most severe disease pressure and, and was provided by uh, Briskway at 1.2 ounces, uh, BASF program number one, Bayer program number two, and UCR05. Uh, while only Bayer program number one at this date, September 9th, maintained the disease cover below 5%. Um, Basically, the, the, the take home message of this and our previous anthracnose studies is that programmatic approach should be considered uh, basically as a standard approach when high anthracnose pressure is uh, being anticipated. And then the uh, additional thing that we saw uh, with the data uh, from October 7 is that their program number two provided longer lasting control than and better recovery at six weeks after final treatment when compared to uh, their program number uh, one. Sorry for the little bit of haze here in my uh, presentation. Thank you for your attention. And uh, on behalf of the whole crew, uh, I invite you to our next, hopefully, uh, in-person uh, research field day. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. So we have, a, we, I, we don't have any questions yet for you, but we do have one that Ming Ying has from Frank. Um, does Savatis have a temp application limit? Um, Ming Ying, I know that you've answered it online, but could you answer that live by typing it? Um, for my application, I normally do it before the temperature goes up to 85 Fahrenheit. Uh, but for the label, I don't recall there, they mentioned, I don't think there is a temperature range mentioned in the label, uh, at least not what I can recall. Great. So we just have a few more minutes. There was one in here from Kevin Morris um, that Adam had answered by typing and it's about Kikuya grass. I'm not sure if you wanna take that from um, what is the advantage of using Kikuya over Bermuda? Christian, that was for you. And I think both you and Adam had answered that one. Um, do you want to answer that live so everybody can hear the answer to that? I think I could take this one. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, mm, the thing with the Kikuyu grass, it's, I would say that Bermuda grass is actually great grass here. Uh, the Kikuyu grass that it was answered in the, in the question and answer uh, pop-up, uh, um, excuse me, uh, the winter color retention is way better. Uh, the, uh, and that's a huge advantage here. So this is the trait that we don't have to work so much on it. We also evaluate it for a color, but this is like the least of our concerns. Uh, it was mentioned in another question that this is on a noxious weeds list. And that's all because of its uh, vigor and aggressiveness. And this is the thing we, we work the most on. And um, so the thing is, it's not only a matter of if it's better or not, but also a question if it's here and what we can do about it. And Kikuyu grass is definitely here in California. Some of the golf courses already switched to Kikuyu grass and uh, they have it in their fairways. So we, are, we know that people work with it, that people see uh, it's um, 
uh, perks of, of using Kikuyu grass, sometimes they don't have choice because it's difficult to er eradicate. And uh, what we're trying to do is uh, work on the grass that is already here. And it can be improved. Uh, as Sada mentioned, there is a question how we remove uh, the more aggressive grass with the less aggressive grass. But, well, we are working also, a lot of people is working on eradicating kikuyu grass. So I think we could work around that. And um, I talked to the superintendents and those that have kikuyu grass, they, they seem to be quite happy about it. Uh, people that don't have kikuyu grass, they try to avoid it at any cost. Great, yeah, um, and I think we've handled all of the questions. Please let us know quickly if um, there were any other questions that came up that we have not addressed. It looks like it's all empty right now. Um, thank you all, and we're right back on time for Jim to close out. <laughs> thank you, Sherry. Uh, again, Thanks to all of our speakers for a great presentation today on time, except for myself. Sorry about that, but uh, you know me, you all. So I uh, just wanted to uh, type a few loose ends, some things I forgot to mention earlier. First, uh, a shout out to Dr. Marco Schiavon, who's uh, with us in this meeting today. Marco is one of the new uh, assistant professors of turf grass science at the University of Florida. So uh, Marco, uh, thanks for being here and thanks for all you've done for our program. Uh, many of the presentations you've heard today, the projects, uh, you know, Marco was there to lay the groundwork for. So uh, we, we appreciate his, his help and support. Uh, and then finally, I just want to uh, thank our industry for all their support. Um, you know, the, the California Turf Grass and Landscape Foundation, which represents uh, the industry, especially the golf industry and sports turf managers and and allows us to, to do all this really good research. Uh, we're very appreciative. And then again, to the, the chemical companies who uh, support us and uh, work together to uh, to help develop products. And uh, we, we, we can't thank you enough, especially this year. You, you saw that earlier slide of all those people in green shirts and those are mouths that I have to feed. And, uh, and thankfully, uh, you, you, with your continued support, uh, we're able to keep moving forward and uh, hope you feel like you're getting a lot of bang for your buck with uh, the number of projects we have going on throughout the, not only in Riverside, but throughout the state and region. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Sherry for some more um, instructions about, uh, about the upcoming trade show. Again, thanks to our sponsors as well.